As fear now begins to settle in among some of the intended audiences of Putin's annexation speech, does it mean we now find ourselves entering a new phase of the war, where an isolated and incapable Russia finds itself unable to physically defend regions it now claims for itself, and turns instead to nuclear strikes? On this and more about Putin's annexation speech, we are now joined with Nina Khrushcheva, professor of international affairs at the New School in New York City. Nina, thanks for joining me uh, here. If I, if I may, f my first question is that in the past few days, the Times has published information that Russia will soon conduct nuclear weapons testing. And uh, we heard Putin himself Recently, he said that he is not bluffing when he insisted that Russia may take action with any and all of its weapons arsenal. So what do you think? Is he bluffing or not when it comes to nuclear weapons? We don't know. I mean, he's the only man who knows whether he's bluffing or not. Um, I want to quote Olaf Scholz, who just said that he doesn't want to speculate whether Russia is going to use nuclear weapons uh, or is not going to use nuclear, nuclear weapons. Um, I'm also sure that you saw something that was confirmed this morning. They got back to their, maybe yesterday, um, they got back to their um, agreement, the Five Nation Agreement on uh, in January, that they're uh, determined not to use nuclear nuclear weapons. So I actually thought that this was a sign of a little bit of a, of a blinking, because there had been so much conversation about whether, whether he will, whether he won't, and so on. And therefore, it seems that they decided to put forward some sort of a kind of consolation for everybody to chill, to calm down. But of course, you know, when the president, uh, in a variety of speeches now, mentions, Russian president mentions that uh, he's not going to uh, have every, any, he's not going to have anything on the table. Of course, there's going to be a huge discussion, but I hope that he is warning and bluffing. On the other hand, by now, we've seen that if Putin says he's going to do something, he actually does this. And uh, uh, the fear is that it seems to me that if he has some sort of set of tools on the table, he may be wanting to use them if he needs to. If we, if, if we think that he may use it, uh, is it, is it a big discussion in the United States right now? Because I saw the uh, recent interview of Mr. Sullivan from National Security uh, Council, uh, where he was, he was telling that this possibility exists. What would be the, the reaction from the United States? Um, Mr. Biden and other representatives of the U.S. government, they've been insisting that the U.S. is not and will not be a part in this conflict. But if Kremlin actually uses nuclear weapon, what will be the reaction? What do you think? Well, they also say the White House has been saying uh, quite, quite um, uh, consistently that they don't think that uh, that Russia will use nuclear weapons. They also say that they don't see any preparation for Russia yeah, to use nuclear weapons. Right. So they consider it, right, they consider it a bluff. Um, but of course, they have to take this uh, uh, into serious account. Uh, some of the discussion that I've been reading and hearing in the United States, it's that the United States doesn't really need to use nuclear weapons. In fact, it's perfectly capable, if Russia does use nuclear weapons, perfectly capable of, of uh, shutting down all sorts of Russian potential, what just the, uh, was uh, with regular weapons. And in the last seven months, uh, Putin has shown, the Russian army has shown that it's a rather inadequate instrument. I mean, you know, he probably now they may think that they should not be doing this because then everybody was afraid uh, in February. Nobody is afraid of the Russian army anymore. So the United States doesn't think that it, it needs even to use nuclear weapons to uh, shut Russia down. And I think that would, if, I mean, I, I, as, as, as Olaf Scholz said, I don't want to speculate. I don't know, because this is really a discussion that is highly hypothetical. Still, the United States may be able to confront Russia on this. Russia becomes a country that uses nuclear weapons. The United States does not, which certainly then damages Russia, if we survive, uh, damages Russia repu Russia's reputation more in the United States actually uh, acts 
in a responsible fashion. So, the, of course, Putin would say, and he already said that, uh, that the United States used the, uh, the nuclear weapons already in, uh, in, uh, in Japan, and therefore, almost as if, therefore, Russia can do this. Uh, but still, I think we're a little bit some way to go to, to get to this, to, to an actual conversation. What do you think about Putin's speech on uh, last Friday when he was announcing the annexation of uh, these four Ukrainian regions? How, how did you find it? Did it? Was it interesting to you, listening to Mr. Putin's speech? It, it was. And, you know, I mean, Tikhon, you and I have been for years talking about propaganda. So, I'm, you know, I like a good propaganda speech. I'm, <laughs> um, I'm, I'm very... Um, I'm very open to to beautiful connection of unconnectable things. But I have to say, this was a very disappointing speech. It almost felt, and we discussed this before, but, you know, kind of well, the Putin popularity was almost like he was James Bond uh, of contemporary Russia, you know, doing all this, all this fancy stuff and all this stuff that James Bond does. Uh, and somehow I think he sort of played it and played it and played it and sort of got into his head because James Bond, Bondiana usually does, uh, got into his head and he just got into an absolute James Bond villain. I was listening to this piece like, wow, that was just, you know, every single James Bond villain mashed in one thing with the grandiosity of, of arguments, with the imperial something. Also, as you've heard, uh, we are now uh, apparently were slaves of the West. And also the wonderful thing is that apparently we were the victim of colonialism while we are an empire and there are colonies that we still try to colonize. So it, it was one of those moments that uh, even... I, who love a good propaganda speech, just felt that, you know what, you are not delivering because the contradictions, I mean, for example, Ilyin, Ivan Ilyin, the philosopher yeah. that he loved so much, who was, who was, who, as you know, lived in Switzerland and, and was considered the, uh, the agent of uh, Joseph Goebbels. And then Putin so talks about Ivan Ilyin and then says, oh, and the sanctions and the lies about Russia, they are on par with Goebbels, all these lies that Goebbels live. Like, I'm sorry, this is just so Orwell, George Orwell 2022, like we've never seen in real life. Mm -hmm. How would you explain the uh, obsession Mr. Putin has with the history? In, in this speech, he was uh, again uh, speaking a lot about uh, about history, and uh, in particular, there is some sort of an uh, obsession with Nikita Khrushchev. Yeah, well, I mean, Khrushchev is a very is a very easy target for him because he doesn't look like power. He did never pretended to look like power. He actually probably, I mean, I'm probably biased. Actually, I'm not biased. Uh, one of the few leaders the Soviet Union ever had who, who cared about people. I mean, I was thinking today about um, um, about potential famine in 1963. There was very poor grain crop, and he bought uh, and he bought grain from Canada and the United States. And then he was just being slaughtered for this. And he said, "No, I." Don't slaughter me because I don't want people to starve the way it would have been or it was in 1932 and 1946. So he does have this thing that, that Khrushchev was sort of a weakling. But this whole thing about colonialism, I thought it was interesting because our country was the first which addressed colonialism and we spoke for all these other nations. In fact, it was Khrushchev who spoke for all these other nations. He was the one who addressed the issue of colonialism in 1960. Of course, he didn't get... He didn't get a name mentioning. So, yes, I think Putin is sort of this hobby historian who pulls out historical, um, historical narratives the way they suit him. And we know that from many leaders and especially dictatorial leaders because they do look at history uh, as, as a guide to their future. I mean, we know that about Putin. I mean, suddenly all this, you know, the, the statues to uh, Vladimir the Great, the statue to Ivan the Terrible, suddenly being erected as sort of this predecessors of Putin, of, uh, of Putin the Great. So he does, have, he does have that thing, but unfortunately, I mean, I think he just learns wrong, wrong lessons from history, if, if one can learn. I mean, let, let's 
let's take the Cuban Missile Crisis, if he's so obsessed with Khrushchev. Remember, Cuban Missile Crisis got resolved in 13 days because when both leaders realized that, that the world's um, fate at stake, um, the humanity is at stake, they immediately figured out a way to, uh, to handle it. And in fact, Khrushchev got what he wanted out of Kennedy, the, uh, the missiles out of, out of Turkey, American missiles out of Turkey, but uh, it wasn't secret because Kennedy was afraid to lose uh, his reputation to the Republicans. He was a Democratic president, Demo president, Democrat president, and Khrushchev agreed. So he was absolutely ready to take a hit with his reputation for the sake of humanity. Clearly, Putin is not ready at all. Bad lessons of history, that sounds about right. Thank you so much, Nina Khrushcheva, Professor of International Affairs Thank at you. the New School in uh, New York City.